Praise be Jesus Christ, and welcome to a new season of CarmelCast. CarmelCast is a production of the Institute of Carmelite Studies Publications, or ICS Publications, and you can visit our website at www.icspublications.org. So, uh, my name is Father Pier Giorgio of Christ the King, and I'm joined here today by Brother John Mary of Jesus Crucified. And this season on CarmelCast, we're going to be talking about... St. John of the Cross, in particular, a book written by St. John of the Cross called The Living Flame of Love. And right now, as a way to do this sort of book study on The Living Flame of Love, uh, we've recently released a new study edition of this work. And you can find that on our website, again, icspublications.org. But don't worry if you don't have the book yet, uh, because we're not actually going to dive into, the, into the, the first part of the book really until next week. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about the introductory material and the prologue today, um, but you should be fine if at the end of this episode you just go to our website, order that book, and you'll have it just in time for next week to begin reading uh, with the first stanza of the poem. Today we're really talking about St. John the Cross, this whole season talking about St. John the Cross, and we're actually going to be reading a book by St. John the Cross, and this might give some people some anxiety because they've heard things about St. John the Cross, uh, and perhaps be a little intimidated by him. Um, and so why should we read uh, John of the Cross? And, and, and what can you say, what, what can we say to put people's minds at ease about uh, undertaking this book study? Yeah, I think a lot of people, when they think of St. John of the Cross, they think about the dark night of the soul. That's like the first image that comes to their mind or his great asceticism. And these are things that can really scare people. Um, maybe cause people hesitancy about the idea of reading John of the Cross, or perhaps some people have tried to read John of the Cross in the past and have kind of experienced it as this, um, yeah, just a great difficulty in understanding his language and his, his imagery. And so m my word to those people would just be, you're in the exact right place, because um, uh, many Carmelites that I know would say that The Living Flame of Love is the, the first book that you should read. And in terms, in terms of titles too, it's it's probably the least intimidating, right? And uh, and and the length too, right? right? So some of John's works are rather long. This book, I think, it's about the, in in the uh, original the complete works, it's less than eighty pages. The study edition is a little bit longer, but mm -hmm. so it's very manageable for someone to kind of first dive into the 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 writings of Saint John of the Cross. Yeah, and I think in comparison to something like the Ascent of Mount Carmel or the Dark Knight. Even the title of The Living Flame has a, more of an attraction to us. Yes. What many people who may know more about the writings of St. John of the Cross might say then is, well, why are, you, why are we doing, for your first book study of St. John of the Cross, why, why start at The Living Flame? Because isn't that the culmination of the spiritual life? Isn't that where John's speaking of uh, the heights of mystical union with God and the fruits of that? And yeah. so what might we say to that person who is, has that sort of a question about the title? Yeah, it's a good question because that's that really is what the living flame of love is about. It's about this soul that's perfectly united to God in this life. And so it might seem kind of counterintuitive, like why would we start there um, at the beginning? Why wouldn't we start at the beginning? Why would we start at the end? And really, I think there are, are several reasons for that. I think the most important reason for me is that the the view from the summit can help us make sense of the journey that we have to follow. Um, a great image of this, I think, is, I, I don't know, do you remember when we lived in Oregon, we went to Smith, uh, Smith Rock. Smith Rock. It's my, yeah. one of my favorite places on Say something on about <laughs> this, this state park. What is it like? Well, so I, I had visited it, uh, when we were living in Oregon and it's, it's just, it's on the arid side of the Cascades. So it's, it's a high desert sort of environment. Um, and you are looking at, uh, coming down from, we lived on the, temperate side of the of the cascade so we you crest the the divide of of the mountain range and you come into a, a high desert um you have these giant volcanoes behind you and uh pretty much it's it sort of flattens out ahead of you but then at smith rock there's these formations that were caused by uh, erosion of a river and uh this river uh has created these beautiful rock formations that tower above you and it's a it's a rock climbing sort of mecca for for many american rock climbers yes and it, it like the way i describe it it kind of looks like the moon like yeah. that's what i would imagine <laughs> like the moon to look like it's like this just this dry kind of rock formations everywhere and we went there once and a, a bunch of the brothers went for a hike but i went out for a run on my own and it was 
you know, getting out like towards the middle of the day, starting to get pretty hot. I had, I had brought a water bottle with me, but I had run out of water. And I realized at one point that I was lost. <laughs> and I like for a second, it flashed in my mind, like I'm going to die out here in this desert because I have no idea where I am or how to get back to where I need to go. And I wasn't even sure if I was on a path anymore because mm -hmm. the path, it was hard to differentiate the path from the rest of the desert. So I looked around, I found the highest point and I went up to the highest point. And from there I had a good sense of the land. I could see the pathways. Uh, I could see which direction I needed to go. Yeah. And so I think that's just a good image for us in the spiritual life of so often when we're in the midst of it, um, the, 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 obstacles around us to seem insurmountable. We're not sure which direction to go. We're not even sure if we're on the right path, let alone any path at all. And yet if we can get the view from the height, from the summit, then it helps us uh, to see the way to go. And I think, I think St. John of the Cross, even um, when he's writing the commentary on the living flame, and we'll get into the distinction between the commentary and the poem itself, but the when he's writing the commentary, he even has in mind um, the path that we've just tread. And and so even from his his authorial perspective, he's thinking of he's thinking of the entire uh, the, the entire uh, spiritual life from beginning to end. Yes. Um, and and Father Kieran in, in some of the study guides that we'll be reading throughout this this book study even goes into where in some of the stanzas of the poem um, John is is looking back mm -hmm. or he's looking forward to the future too. So there's these different sort of dimensions in the narrative of the text. And, and so you, you do, you have this whole uh, sense of the spiritual life, even though uh, he's speaking, one of the major themes he's speaking of is the, the culmination of the mystical life, which is union with God. Right. Yeah. And then connected to that point, another reason I think is um, it, it's wrong for us to think that because we're not there at the summit that we that what the, the realities that John's talking about don't relate to us in a real way here and now. Right. The way that the spiritual life works is that um, through faith, we already possess what is the same reality of union with God that's possessed at the summit. It's just that we don't, ex we don't yet ex um, experience it in its fullness. We don't yet possess it in its fullness, but we do in a very real way here and now. And so um, all the things that John's talking about for this soul are can be applied to our own spiritual lives, if not in a one-to-one -one way, but at least in a close way, such that it can be something uh, to guide us on the path. Yeah, St. John of the Cross had a very Thomistic framework that he was working with, and one of the important aspects of, of uh, Thomism uh, as sort of a, a way of thinking, an epistemology you could call it, is this idea of the analogy of being. And so all of creation is, uh, is has a participation in, in the highest form of, of being, which is God. And so we can apply this, this sort of framework to the spiritual life in the sense of even at the heights of, the, of mystical experience, even, even in the fullness of, of union with God, even partial union with God or, or a, a step along the way mm -hmm. towards union with God has some of the same terrain. It, it has, it's analogous to the, to the highest Yes portion of it, I guess you could say. And so if we look at the fullness at the highest point, uh, it's not, it's not dissimilar to what a beginner might be experiencing, um, at that level, you know, right. in, 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 um, in proportion to, yes. to their, uh, union with God in a sense. Yes. And so that's an important way to, to think about this book as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that, um, there's, there's no, there's no, um, there's nothing lacking. Um, there's nothing foreign from beginning to end. It's it's all the same. It's all the same journey. Yes. And so this is going to have similar characteristics throughout. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And then w one last thing that I would add to that of why why we should read the Living Flame of Love uh, is that I think seeing this soul that's perfectly united to God uh, can help to encourage us on our own path. At times in the midst of our struggles in the spiritual life, our frustrations, sometimes we feel like we're running into a wall and not getting anywhere. Um, sometimes we need to be reminded of what it is, the goal that we're striving for. And so reading about this can really help to encourage us along the way. Yeah. Good. So um, is there anything is there anything else you wanted to, we should maybe add to, to this why we should be reading this? One last thing, and maybe this should have been the first thing we should have mentioned, but... John of the Cross was writing this work for a laywoman. 
Okay, yeah. Um, and he was writing this for a laywoman who, and fr- from what we know about her, we don't know a lot, but it seems that she hadn't yet reached this stage of the spiritual life. She hadn't yet reached the heights of the spiritual life. So John isn't just writing ab- about a soul for uh, who's who's reached perfection for us for people who are already experiencing it. Instead, he's writing for people like us who aren't there yet for all these purposes to help us, to encourage us. Right. And I think that's going to be very important. It, it's not just written for religious. It's not just written for priests. It's not just written for saints. It's written for those of us who are striving. And so this is a good transition to talk about the differences between the poem and the commentary. And this is a common sort of characteristic of St. John of the Cross's writings. Usually he has written a poem. And he shared this poem with various people, and then various people ask him to explain what he's written in his poem. And so in this sense, John has written the poem, The Living Flame, um, as an expression of his own experience. So there's a testimonial aspect to it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Doña Ana de Peñolosa, she gets a hold of this poem, and she asks John, can you explain this to me? Uh, She's heard from other people that he's, he's, he's done these long commentaries for other people. And so she wants, she's, she's a very, um, uh, love St. John the Cross, very, a devotee of him, um, is, is a great benefactress to the, to the Carmels that he's, he, uh, lives in at various points throughout his, his, uh, life as a friar. And so she asks him, well, maybe he'll write me a commentary about this poem that I really like. Mm-hmm. And so this is a, just a distinction between um, how this was written. The poem was written first, mm-hmm. and then the commentary was written a couple of years later. Right. Yeah, and, and I think that it can be helpful to remember that the poem is, um, it's so closely linked to the spiritual experience. Um, it's not, it's, it's an expression. I think that's what you said. It's an expression of a spiritual experience. So I think it's not just describing about something, but it's actually like experiencing it. It's the poem is the experience of this spiritual experience that John, John is trying to convey to us. And so if we take that even one step further, um, one thing that's interesting, I, I've thought a lot about the idea of, um, we call John's prose here, a commentary, but a common, commentary is not the Spanish word that's used. It's In Spanish, it's declaración or a declaration. And so I looked up like, what, what does that word mean in Spanish? And it means to like express what is hidden in something. And so John is not so much writing a commentary on his poem as he's revealing uh, what is hidden behind or in the words of the poem about the spiritual experience. He's expounding mm-hmm. further on the mysteries that are contained there. So I think it's helpful for me to, to, to realize it's not like we're getting further and further away from some experience that he's just describing in the past. But John's hope is that in reading the poem, in some sense, we're experiencing this union with God or we're growing in this union with God through the expression of the poem, mm-hmm. and also with a the commentary. They're not, they're not so far separated from one another. There's an interesting sort of um, literary distinction that I guess you could make in terms of what is poetic writing. And, um, you know, some literary theorists will say that, well, a poem expresses what in prose is ineffable. Mm. Um, and so there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a literary sort of character to the writing that allows it to, um, to take on uh, a meaning that is is not explicated mm-hmm. through sentences, yes. um, and so there's there's a deepness, there's a richness to it. Little little uh, word selections, this over that, are very intentional because they make carry specific meanings beyond the dictionary meaning. I guess you could say that there might be a contextual sense that's going on in this word. Um, there may be uh, something with the meter of the poem or the the timbre of the poem that allows it to take on a characteristics characteristic of uh, maybe in this case uh, love, mm-hmm. and so um, or or something that is that is very um, divine in nature, yes. and so this poetry is is a is a means is a mode of being able to express these sort of feelings these senses these these movements of the soul in writing and and I would even say that in the the commentary the prose section that. John is very much, he's right on the line of almost reaching that same, that same sort of poetry. There's times in his writing where he just kind of um, 
goes off into this sort of ecstatic sort of writing. And one thing that, that I mean, it's incredible. John, it said that John wrote this work in 15 days, um, over a span of 15 days when he was very busy. Mm-hmm. He had many other tasks uh, at the time when he was living in the monastery. And yet he wrote this in such a short time. And so it shows that there's, there is something, this is not just uh, him sitting down in like an intellectual um, sort of, yeah, cold sort of way and writing about a past experience that he once had. In his experience of writing the, the commentary, he's again putting himself in, in, into that experience and writing from that place mm-hmm. so that we too, in reading it, experience it in some way. Right. Just to speak a little bit more about the context of, of when John is writing this, he's writing it um, when he while he's a uh, prior mm-hmm. in Granada. Uh, and so maybe just speak a little bit about that those sort of circumstances. You had mentioned that he was at, he was writing it at a time where he's very busy, but also something about about Granada. We we got to, had the opportunity to visit Granada last summer, and it's it's a very beautiful city. Yeah. Um, and, and so there's there's even aspects of of that that might come into to how John is expressing himself as well. Yeah, and we get to spend there in Granada, you know, a good amount of time outdoors, just walking around and seeing the scenery and and the beauty of the nature there too. And I think that's something in particular that uh, I could reflect on of like how it was that this environment influenced John of the Cross because he really is, he's a romantic poet. Mm-hmm. And um, he he's writing from a place of, of experience primarily. And so I think that the whole context of his time period, his environment, um, just his Spanish culture, like comes forth in this in this yeah. work. To speak a little bit about his um, his busyness, then mm-hmm. at this time. So not only is he prior of of the monastery uh, Campo de los Martires in Granada, and he's trying to get that off the ground. He's building aqueducts to bring water to the place because there was no water where they were. Uh, that was a little bit before, probably when he, when he wrote this, but. Uh, simultaneously, he's also trying to help the nuns mm-hmm. get off the ground. So it's like he's he's trying to essentially found two monasteries at this period in his life. And he also had a, you know a good number of spiritual directees, um, and he would have been involved. Yeah, and in many he would have many responsibilities. And so it wasn't like this was just a time where he had fifteen days straight to just sit and write and no other responsibilities. Because the account that we have of him mentions that he wrote this in 15 days amidst many other responsibilities that he had. And so this says a lot to us, I think, because we might have the wrong idea that um, the spiritual life or a a life of prayer is therefore one that is withdrawn from responsibilities Mm -hmm. or withdrawn, completely withdrawn from the, your daily life and, and, and sort of what's going on in the world. Um, and, and this is sort of a testimony that, no, if, if we are truly embracing the spiritual life, if we are truly uh, seeking union with God, then that comes with us. He comes with us wherever we go yes. in that sense. And, and so we're bringing God to the world when we uh, are participating in a life of prayer. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have to make time for that, obviously. But it doesn't mean that once you're there that you're just going to go up to your mountain in solitude for the rest of your life. Right. Yeah. John was not removed from the world in this, especially not during this time. And that's something actually we can get to a little bit in the prologue too, because he mentions some of what is happening with him interiorly as mm-hmm. he's writing this work. I was wondering though, if you could say something about John and how he's known in his, like his poetry is, is known. John, John the poet. Yeah. So um, it's a really interesting like sort of tidbit about him. He was declared the patron of Spanish poets by the what's essentially the, the Spanish Academy. I don't know if that's actually what it's called, but it's the basically the, the linguistic, the literary sort of Academy of Spain. He was considered to be uh, among the greatest Spanish poets who ever lived. Uh, he's considered to be um, probably the representative of of what's called the Sigla de Oro, the uh, the Spanish Golden Age, so the, the 16th century, where Cervantes is writing, and and of course Saint Teresa as well. Uh, and so all of these, this is when uh, Velázquez is painting. This is when um, this is when El Greco is painting. So a great literary and artistic period in in, in Spanish history. And, and John, St. John of the Cross, is seen as a representative of that age. Mm-hmm. So among all those, those brilliant artists and, 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 and literary uh, writers, uh, he's, he's considered to be a representative of, of that entire golden age of Spain. And it's interesting, we, when we um, 
when we sell our books uh, at ICS Publications, the collected works of John of the Cross are actually often purchased by universities for uh, secular universities for your Spanish language classes. And so when you take a class in the liter literature of Spain in the 16th century, these professors want you to read St. John of the Cross. So he's, he's someone whose poetry is not just read by Carmelites or by people seeking um, a spiritual life or reading Catholic books, but even he's considered to be a great uh, poet on, on in the secular world as well. And in terms of from that perspective, I guess you could say. Yeah. And, and you were speaking earlier about kind of the tone and the meter and all of that of John's poetry. And I was speaking how this is really an expression of an experience that John is having, um, the living flame of love specifically. And I think that it can be hard for us to see that sometimes in our translations. Mm. So, right, John's writing in Spanish, right. and we have most of us just read English, and so that's what we're reading. Um, and so I was thinking it would be helpful. Um, we're going to have one of our Spanish friars recite uh, the living flame of love for us in Spanish. That way all of you can hear um, the poem in, in the way that it's, it's meant to be portrayed. And you can hear some more of the lyrical elements that are, are lost in translation of the English. Oh, llama de amor viva, que tiernamente hieres, de mi alma en el más profundo centro, pues ya no eres esquiva, acaba ya si quieres, rompe la tela de este dulce encuentro. Oh, cauterio suave, oh, regalada llaga, oh, mano blanda, oh, toque delicado, que a vida eterna sabe y toda deuda paga, matando muerte en vida la has trocado. O lámparas de fuego en cuyos resplandores las profundas cavernas del sentido, que ya estaba oscuro y ciego, con extraños primores, calor y luz dan junto a su querido. Cuán manso y amoroso recuerdas en mi seno, donde secretamente solo moras, y en tu aspirar sabroso, de bien y gloria lleno, cuán delicadamente me enamoras. So in, in hearing the Spanish, we can hear some of the, even the rhyme scheme that, that comes uh, through this. And this is an ABC, ABC. Um, each stanza runs six lines. And so you have an ABC, ABC form. So for instance, Viva rhymes with Esquiva. Quieres rhymes with Quieres. And Centro rhymes with Encuentro. Yes. So you, could, you, can, you can pick up that rhyme scheme uh, in the Spanish, which that's almost impossible to replicate in the English unless you're very talented. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and yeah, so a lot of this, a lot of the feel of the poem is lost in our English translation. But one thing I would say is that the English translation in the study edition, the, um, the study edition by Father Kieran Kavanaugh is, I think, a very good translation. Um, again, when you translate poetry, you're going to be losing some things. I think Father Kieran, this translation, though, it does a great job of keeping the, the meaning, a more literal meaning. Right. Um, but in doing so, it sacrifices some more of the feel. And so actually one thing, when I was studying a lot the difference between the English and Spanish, I realized that at times we, reading the English translation, might have a better understanding of what John of the Cross meant than a Spanish speaker today would have reading the Spanish and the reason why is because over those 500 years, a lot of the Spanish words have changed meanings. And so a Spanish speaker today would read them as though they mean the same things today, when really we have a translator who's gone through, looked at what did those words right. mean in the context of John of the Cross and translated them as such in the English. Right. So, so it actually is, can give us a, a benefit. So whereas meaning is lost in Spanish from the 16th century to the 21st century, well, a 21st century translator is translating both across languages and across centuries. Yes. And, you know, there's different strategies too, to, uh, as a way to, to, um, to translate poetry. And, and so you'll even see in, in Father Kieran's translation, things like in jam mint, where the, the next line, actually, he moves it to the line proceeding in order to maintain some of the meter in it. So it's, it's one of those things you can't have everything in mm -hmm. a translation, uh, but you can do a lot and, and, and gain a lot from it. And so, and it's, 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 uh, the best we have in a sense as well. Yeah. Outside of being a 16th century Spaniard. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Good. So, um, why don't we jump right in, into the prologue then? Um, so the prologue, uh, is sort of the, the first thing that, that St. John of the Cross uh, is writing as an introduction before he even gets to the stanzas. Uh, so remember he's already written the poem, these, these four stanzas. 
and uh, and now he is introducing the commentary with a prologue. Yeah, one thing that sticks out to me is often when I'm reading a work, I just kind of skip over the prologue or <laughs> just you know read it very quickly. And this this prologue is so short. I mean, it's we have four paragraph numbers here, and I think it's so rich though, and there's so much to be gleaned um, about John of the Cross, but also for our own spiritual lives um, from this prologue. And so, even from like the very beginning, we John writes, "I have felt somewhat reluctant." So he's he's saying he felt reluctant to even write this work to begin with. Why? Because this is speaking about something that's so intimate to the depth of his soul that the idea of sharing it is very difficult for him so it's not he's not saying he's writing about the heights of the spiritual life and that's why because it's hard to explain he's writing no it's something that's so close to me Mm -hmm. that revealing it um, seems to take away from the beauty and intimacy of it and so there's this great uh, humility with which john's even approaching this topic in in his reluctance to share and yet, because he's being asked, so here it says, he's, re- he's responding to this very noble and devout lady. He's responding to Dona Anna, who's asked him to comment on this. Out of his love for her and out of his pastoral uh, care for her, he is willing to share something that's even so intimate to his heart. Yeah, and so this would have been difficult for him just in the sense of, of sharing uh, his testimony, sharing the inmost steps to his of his soul, mm-hmm. knowing that the person who is going to be reading this is a laywoman, yes. which may have may have uh, raised some alarms in his own heart mm-hmm. with respect to uh, whether that was proper for a religious prior to do. Even. Yes, yeah, that, that's an interesting point as well. It, it is. It's. I think it can be. Again, it's helpful for us though to realize that um, our, we're not so different from Doña Ana as well, and so. John is speaking to us as well in this text, not just to her in a historical sense, but to our own experience. And then he starts to speak of, of how he had to wait for a particular moment in his, in his own life to be able to, to write this. He, he speaks about, um, he says, I have deferred this commentary until now, a period in which the Lord seems to have uncovered some knowledge and bestowed some fervor. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so even it's speaking of of sort of the uh, the manifold aspects of the spiritual life and the ups that come with ups and downs that come with um, the us dealing with our, our sensible nature our our fallen nature um, and distractions as they come and go so even even for Saint John of the Cross the mystical doctor he can't even really get his headspace into this into writing a commentary about this poem. Um, until until he's able to become somewhat more recollected, uh, so it speaks a little bit about um, kind of the the variation in the spiritual life, even even when someone has uh, achieved what is we would ex- expect to be union with God as it is accessible in this world. Yes, yeah, and actually one of the two letters that we have two letters that John wrote to Doña Ana, and one of them he expresses this dryness that he's experiencing inwardly in his soul. Um, it's actually, it's a beautiful letter. He's talking about the dryness of the desert exteriorly and also his interior experience. And this is a letter he wrote um, towards the very end of his life. And so we see that the, I think, yeah, we have this misconception that those who have reached the heights of the spiritual life, their interior experience, their experience of prayer is somehow so different from our own. But we see once again that like John's experience, even at the heights of the spiritual life, he still experiences times of dryness, uh, times of difficulty. And so he's waiting to write this until he's at a, a place of interior peace. And um, a, a place, again, it, it shows to me how closely connected this commentary is to the experience himself itself. It's He's not writing it from a place far removed, looking back on a past experience, but it's something that is currently happening within his soul that he's commenting on. He speaks in the prologue too about what is going to be some of his aids uh, along the way of trying to express himself. And he yes. mentions, um, of course, the teaching of the church and uh, the other arm of the church, the sacred scripture. So these yes. two these two arms of revelation that come to us, both the teaching of the church and, uh, and the support of, of sacred scripture. So throughout, uh, you're going to find him constantly citing sacred scripture. So it it speaks to uh, how much John knew of the Bible 
and how much he studied the Bible as well. Yes. Yeah, I think throughout the Living Flame, there's, it's over, it's, I think it's over 200 explicit references to Scripture um, within the flame itself. Actually, if you read, uh, there's a beautiful commentary in the study edition by Father Kieran, uh, a beautiful introduction where he talks about John and, and Scripture. And I forget the exact phrasing he uses, but it's he says that Scripture arrogates the ground mm. uh, of John's spiritual life. Yeah, it's Scripture is like so much a part of who he is that he just like sees the world through this lens of Scripture, mm -hmm. and that's why on every single page of the Living Flame you're going to find scriptural references. It's the the kind of the foundation through which John understands everything in his life. Uh, another interesting thing to me is the the reading right at the beginning of paragraph two here. John writes. There's no reason to marvel at God's granting such sublime and strange gifts to souls he decides to favor. If we consider that he is God and that he bestows them as God with infinite love and goodness, it does not seem unreasonable. Hmm. And it's interesting to me that the idea that these gifts, even when we read about them here, when we talk about them here in this work, they almost seem like something too good for us. It's too good for me. And so we, we marvel at and we, we almost, we question like, could this really be? And what John is saying is that we don't need to question that because of who God is. If you consider that he's God and that he bestows them as God with infinite love and goodness, if we trust who God is, then we can accept like, no, this is, this is something that I'm called to. This isn't just something that John of the Cross experienced 500 years ago, but this is what God is calling me to live today. Right. Yeah, and so it, it, it's it's another twist on uh, what maybe some people misunderstand about humility and, and thinking that that as a virtue is is something that says that I'm not good enough to receive grace. I'm mm -hmm. not good enough to receive mystical graces either. Um, and so that's not that's not what's at play here because it has nothing to do with you because it's grace. It's, it's a free gift. It's full, it's full gift. It's, it's yes. the, it's the supernatural. Mm -hmm. And so it's not, it has no bearing on your nature. It, you have to cooperate with it in the sense of detaching yourself from inordinate affections and sin. But there is, um, there's nothing that about you that is unable to re receive this because it's all about what God is and, and that he's giving it to us. Right. So to be truly humble would be to realize that I can't accept this, but God can. Right. And, 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 and he's, he's calling me to that. And, and one comment, I mean, on the incredible heights that John's talking about here, it's really, if, if we even understood the realities that John's talking about here, it would just like blow our minds completely. And if you look in the third paragraph of this prologue, John talks about perfection one can reach in this life transformation in God. And that's a very interesting phrase because um, in the Spanish, it's it, it has a slightly different meaning. Maybe you could say a word on on a preposition. So like the phrase yeah. in Spanish is transformacion in Dios. It's right. the same, right? Transformation in God. But that word in, in English, I-N, and Spanish, E-N, has a slightly different meaning. Maybe you can say something about like preposition. You know more. You know a lot about translation. Something about prepositions in general. Right. So prepositions are notoriously idiomatic from language to language. And so what is what is the preposition in one language? Um, I'll give you an example. There's a preposition in German by, and we might expect that it matches our preposition by, but it doesn't. <laughs> They're completely different, and it has to do with how words are formed and, and syntax over time and the development of language. Remember that English is developing in a completely different world as Spanish. Yes. And so the use of prepositions are developing differently. And so what may be a preposition in one language looks like the same preposition in another language, but they have completely different meanings. And so there's an right. example. Yes. En in Spanish might look a lot like in in English, but they have developed differently over time. Right. So um, in, E-N in Spanish uh, can have a, a broader meaning than our understanding of in in English. It can mean in, or it could also mean into. It can involve movement towards mm -hmm. something. And so just think about that in English, transformation into God. It okay. carries a, a very strong connotation right. and a connotation that kind of makes us like, be like, whoa, what are you, what are you saying here? But if we read the rest of John's works, that's not um, 
contrary to what he says in other places. He says, we become God by participation. Mm -hmm. It's very strong language. Yes, we, we always remain who we are. We're not just like lost into this sea of God and, and lose our individuality. Um, we remain, uh, you remain Father Pier Giorgio, um, even when you're united to God. But you, through your participation, through your acts, through your, your actions, through um, your interior actions in particular, your, your will becomes the will of God. Mm -hmm. Your intellect becomes the intellect of God. It, it's like such an incredible thing that we're called to the heights of this. It, it shouldn't surprise us if we've read the gospel, right? Exactly. <laughs> so yes. this is something that is very <laughs> present within, within our Lord's teaching. Yes. And as particular, it comes, comes out alive in, in, in John's gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of linguistic sort of things going on there. So, uh, St. John the Evangelist is, you know, that gospel. So it, it really shouldn't, I mean, it does, it, it like kind of shocks you to hear someone say these things, but it, it really it shouldn't surprise us based on what our Lord taught. Yeah. So I, I just encourage people when they're reading, when they see that phrase, transformation in God, like really think about what that means each time you read it, like transformation into God. What What is it that I'm called to? These It's these in, just the incredible, um, the miraculous, the, the pure gift that we're called to in this mm -hmm. relationship. Maybe one thing we could could end with is, I think for me, like kind of a central, the central image really of the whole living flame of love is this idea of fire mm -hmm. and like a, particularly a log um, or wood that's been penetrated by fire. John introduces that image here just in the beginning of the prologue even, but it's one that he'll come back to at different points throughout the commentary. Right. Oh, yeah, it's that's kind right. of yeah. the central theme. And it kind of, it, even looking back, it's the beginning of the spiritual life, right? We just have like the dead, cold, wet log mm -hmm. that the fire of God's love begins to purify and dry and cleanse and all, you know, it's releasing all this nasty smoke and all of that. And eventually it's transformed into fire such that there becomes, uh, from, from our, our view, there's no difference between the fire and the log itself, right? Cause the, the, the log is just totally consumed in right. the fire of God's love. And that's the same thing that would happen to our soul. This is the transformation into God that he's right. talking about. That, that aspect particularly of like the log is no longer a log. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, no, anything, any chemistry, that's, that's something that probably is, is, uh, you know, analogous in that discipline, the, the fact that this, this is no longer wood. This is, this is being consumed. This is being transformed and it is, it is becoming another substance. Yes. And that's what, yeah, that's what we're called to in God, that, that kind of transformation. Good. Well, with that, like we said at the beginning of the episode, if you have, uh, if you've enjoyed this episode, uh, make sure you pick up your copy of the Living Flame of Love Study Edition available at our website, www.icspublications.org. And you should be able to get that in time for next week where we'll dive, start diving into the, the commentary from the first stanza. Uh, and so we look forward to, to sharing with you throughout this season, throughout this Easter season, uh, the fruits of our reading and study of St. John of the Cross and the Living Flame of Love. So thank you and God bless you.